ting 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 this is a global tellink prepaid call from John Tobias an inmate at the Department of the Interior this week on Diginterp in depth, uh, we'll be talking about series, Cam series and campaigns and all sorts of things that you might be posting uh, multiple times. I'm John Rudy from Harper's Ferry. And this is next to me, it's John Tobiasen from the Harper's Ferry Center, and we'll be discussing this amazing idea with you. We're using, of course, the YouTube Hangout. Uh, that we've got up here, and uh, and we'll be talking about series and serial and, and the zeitgeist of audio and video that's going on right now, um, which is interesting because right now all you can do is hear our audio. But is this powerful? I mean, it's powerful just to hear our voices, isn't it? Well, it's powerful because we do it every day, most yeah. of us. I mean, I call people, I chat with them, I talk to them over the phone, I listen to the radio, I listen to podcasts, ah. I listen to Pandora and iTunes radio. In fact, audio is how we, uh, we end up discussing a lot of stuff. It's how we end up communicating a lot of the time, whether it's music or talk or um, even just the sounds of nature. Uh, it's how we experience our environment so much. Okay, but this is a little hokey, isn't it? So we're going to kick over and at least show you our faces because, yeah, we are on video. Hi. Uh, but, uh, but welcome here to Harper's Ferry, to Matter Training Center, and to DigiInterp In-Depth. Uh, I got to play the, the NPR thing a little bit. That was yeah, fun. Yeah, the first part was the funnest part. Yeah, okay. John even did print survey, doesn't he? He printed out his script. I Phrasing right. Uh, so obviously today we're talking about this new thing that's called podcasts, and this new thing that's called serialized content. Um, go figure that everything old is new again. Um, that things being released on a weekly or a monthly basis, kind of like television has been since, I don't know, its complete beginning, um, is something new and amazingly powerful that we can harness to make interpretive meaning. Right. So I'm going to hop right in. And actually, I'm, I'm going to you know, play NPR host here completely and take over the mic. This is John's, um, John's new mic. Buddy. Yeah, this is my new mic. This is wonderful. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to take over the mic here, and, uh, and we'll get started with, uh, with just a little bit of, of thought on what serialized content means. So serialized content is it's fascinating. Um, and serial meaning making is, is even more powerful. It's when you can build a long-term connection with an audience. Uh, we're used to building connections with audiences that last maybe five, ten minutes. Maybe they last half an hour. Sometimes they last an hour uh, in our resources with our, our physical interpretation. Whether it's just, hi, how you doing? This is what this place might mean. Go investigate. Or whether it's a full-blown, hour-long conducted activity through someplace really powerful and meaningful. We do this type of stuff all the time. This is a little bit different. This is an opportunity to go a step further, uh, to build a long-term relationship with an audience. So I want to st start really right off the top thinking about why we're making meanings. I mean, why are we doing interpretation to begin with? It's something we should ask any time we set out to investigate interpretation in general. Why are we doing this? We're helping to foster uh, engagement with a resource. We're helping to make stewards of a resource. Why are we making meanings? Well, we're making meanings because these places are meaningful. We're drawing the ideas out of them. Uh, we're drawing the native ideas right out of the resource. We do this for preservation. We do this to save places, to keep them safe, and to, well, help taxpayers who pay to keep these places safe understand where their tax dollars are going, uh, and to help them to feel like these places belong to them. They do, in the end, belong to everyone in the nation. One of the interesting questions, though, when we start thinking about serial and series making is that it's not just a single meaning-making moment. 
This is about revisiting meanings, about coming back to an idea, coming back to a place, coming back to a piece of content over and over and over again, a content stream. I mean, park rangers have been content streams forever. It's one of the things we do really well, is stream content. Sometimes we've used the phrase, uh, the fire hose of content, when the stream gets a little too thick and a little too vigorous. And folks come back to the trough over and over and over again. We push this into the digital world, and it means coming back to the trough over and over and over again far easier. You don't have to jump in the car. You don't have to drive to the park. You don't have to look at the schedule and figure out when the park ranger is going to give his program or her program and go out on it and consume it or experience it or dialogue with it. Instead, this one is something you curate, and that's the power of this. We get to create meanings that are curated by our visitors themselves. They choose to subscribe to these meaning-making opportunities. And they choose to revisit. And they choose to revisit in the comfort of their own home or their own car or their own earphones or their own smartphone or their own Facebook stream or their own Twitter feed. Any place, they're choosing to come back again and again and again. So why are they coming back? Well, the best way to ask this question is, why do you come back? Why do you revisit meetings. What meanings do you revisit over and over and over again? What resources do you revisit over and over and over again? Where do you find yourself lingering? It's a powerful question and it's something, again, we are sometimes our best audience. We are sometimes the audience that can, uh, can show ourselves off the best. So if we're, <laughs> if we're thinking about uh, these meaningful places we revisit, well, I just visited a bunch of interesting and meaningful places. Uh, the meaningful and interesting places that I just visited were, um, well, they were in Disneyland. Okay, yeah, I, I'm a geek. I'm a Disney geek. And last week I was able because, well, John's a Disney geek too, so he's, Man, he's over right, here Disney. trying to represent. Um, but I'm a Disney geek, and one of the things that, um, that I got to do last week was I was able to daisy chain some travel together, and I was able to stop at Disneyland for two days while I was out on the West Coast. And one of the things about Disneyland that was so amazing and so powerful and so fun was the fact that I didn't have to ride things once. I could ride things multiple times. I could experience things in depth over and over and over and over and over again. And if you think that I used too many overs in that statement, you don't know me very well. Because that's what I did. I was experiencing that place multiple, multiple, multiple times. And particularly small snippets of it. I was choosing the places, the meanings I wanted to revisit. When you're revisiting meanings, I think there's... I was brainstorming a little bit. I think there's kind of five modes, and some of these overlap, and some of these aren't all that different, but I think there's five modes in general that we, we tend to revisit meanings for. The first one is that, well, they're affirmational. They affirm something we know, something we believe, something we feel, or they reaffirm it. They, they buttress it. They make it better. They make it stronger. They make it faster. They make it, uh, well, more expensive than it was before. Or, sometimes, it's the exact opposite. We revisit stuff because it's disjunctive, because it's dissonant. It, it breaks away from what we feel. It breaks away from our very souls. It's something different, something unique, something varied, something that breaks down our entire belief about the world around us. Sometimes we, we revisit stuff because it's entertaining. It's entertaining. It, it, it feeds us. It feeds our soul. It feeds our brain. It, you know, <laughs> feeds us on the couch while we're just sitting there. And sometimes it goes beyond just entertainment to engagement. It really makes us think and question and come up with new ideas and process and talk to one another and interact and then sometimes we revisit stuff <laughs> because it's destructive. This one's the most interesting to me. My brain kind of spit it out there on the page. Destructive is a fascinating idea. 
if we revisit stuff because it's destructive, kind of that human masochistic tendency, we like to go back to places where massive damage happened and investigate massive damage. Think of, think of the number of times that, uh, that well, a uh, documentary or a, a program might um, show pictures of the Twin Towers falling on 9-11. Um, even though one or two times to illustrate it might be enough, it gets shown over and over and over again. Almost like you're ripping a new hole in the soul every time you plunge that dagger in. It's a fascinating idea, and it's one of the reasons that we consume. We come back to the trough. So if we're thinking about these things and the places I was visiting, um, the places I was visiting were really, really interesting. The places I was visiting, well, they were, <laughs> they were Disney. One of them is one of my favorite places in any Disney park. This was my first trip to Disneyland, but I already knew the place. It was already comfortable, already someplace I kind of knew because I've been to Disney World. And it was the Haunted Mansion. The Haunted Mansion, well, yes, as John just said, the better one. Thank you. <laughs> the Haunted Mansion reaffirms. In this case... I knew it a little bit from before. I knew it as something that I loved, and here I was able to re-experience it. I kept going back over and over to the trough because it was feeding me. It was pushing back inside of me. But part of the reason I go there is that it is a dissonant place. The, the theme of that show is a haunted house where the ghosts are happy and singing, <laughs> where they're singing about being grim but grinning, um, where they're socializing, where they're singing joyful tunes, tunes written, written by Buddy Baker. I mean, this is an amazingly dissonant place. It takes death, and it makes it a joyful celebration. I love that. I don't know why I love it. I'm weird, too. I readily admit that one. Maybe, maybe I'm just funky, and, um, and I believe in this place for all the wrong reasons, but who knows? It's entertaining. Well, anytime you're taking death and making it a happy, bouncy song, it's going to be entertaining to some effect. And it's engaging, too. I rode that thing so many times. I think I rode that ride 15 times. And every time, I was sucked in by a different detail, a different facet of the experience. Suck me right down in. It could be consumed over and over again because it is just so deep and juicy. And it's destructive. Because it's about death. And it's making light of death something that we'll all experience someday. So you walk out of there and you're like, ah, this is fun. This is exciting. And then you stop and you say, but I'm going to die. Memento mori. Remember, death will come. Okay, so the second ride that I rode all, all the time was uh, the Tower of Terror, the Hollywood Tower Hotel, which is a drop ride. It goes up and down. It's based on the Twilight Zone, and I'm a Twilight Zone geek. And again, this is it's a trough I've been to before because I've been to one in Florida, but I've never been to this one. It's pushing back against something that already exists inside my soul. It's, it's giving me a frame of reference I already have, but it's also giving me this different experience. It's a completely different style of architecture, completely different layout inside. The drop profiles, the, the ride in general, is a totally different experience, soup to nuts. But it felt somehow comfortable. It's interesting. It was this moment of... Affirmation but dissonance. Of course, it's a ride. It's meant to be entertaining. And with you know an inspiration like Rod Serling in the Twilight Zone, it can't not be entertaining. But it was engaging, partially because of that same thing. It's not about simple storytelling. It's about complex storytelling. It's about questioning where the boundaries of reality lie and what exactly they mean. And... It's destructive. It's a moment of pain. I mean, we're talking about a thrill ride here, and any thrill ride is a moment of fright, a moment of, of excitement when your heart races and you're feeling that pit in your stomach just drop out. 
it's a painful experience, but that's part of what makes it exciting. And finally, this one. One of the most interesting rides at Disneyland wasn't a ride, it was <laughs> it was a show. It's a show that's been there since 1965. I gotta be the Disney history geek now. Um, it started out at the World's Fair. And it's great moments with Mr. Lincoln. I'm a Civil War person. This spoke to my soul in a way that almost nothing else in the park did. It reaffirmed, it affirmed who I was. It's very patriotic. It's, it's uplifting. It's, it's a powerful, powerful program. But it's also dissonant because it's an artifact of its time. It's focusing on Lincoln. It's focusing on the great man. It's focusing on the war and the destructive nature of war. But it was built in 1963, 64, and 65. So it's more about war than it is about slavery. Which meant I was sitting there going, hmm, hmm. He's talking about destruction being our lot, that it must rise up among us. It can never come from abroad. But he never mentions exactly what that destruction might be. Of course, it's entertaining. Who would not be entertained by a full-scale, six-foot, three-inch tall Abraham Lincoln robot standing on stage ten feet from you, moving his mouth and speaking as the great emancipator? And for that matter, it's engaging. Because when else are you going to be able to witness this and feel like he's in the room with you, physically present? I get that feeling in a couple of places. I got it in this theater. I got it in Washington, D.C., standing in the Lincoln Memorial. And I got it in Lincoln's living room in Springfield. We own two out of those three places in the park service. We don't own Disneyland. Some folks are probably happy about that. Some folks, the historians might be a little sad about that because this place changes all the time. Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln has changed quite a bit since it premiered at the World's Fair. And that's what was destructive to me. Because this was also a moment of, of a sort of masochism. I am a Civil War historian because my mom was a fan of Lincoln. My mom was a fan of Lincoln because in 1964, her family, when she was 12 years old, took her on a trip to New York City, to Queens, and they went to the World's Fair. And she saw great moments with Mr. Lincoln. She saw it a couple times because she became obsessed, 12 years old. She came to love Abraham Lincoln and what he meant. And when I was just about 12 years old, she instilled in me a love of that man and that moment. I lost her this past year. So walking into that theater was this moment of joyful sorrow. It almost felt like something I had to do, a pilgrimage of sorts. I know it sounds weird, probably, to say that I was on a pilgrimage to Disneyland, but I was in some small way. So what does all this have to do with us? Well, we can learn a lot of lessons from these types of moments, from these types of moments of serialized meaning making, of going back to the same trough over and over again. Sometimes that same trough is the exact same content, like I've just described. Sometimes it's a series of content that we produce that's very similar to itself, one after the other after the other. And of course, when we're talking about serialized content, we've got to talk about serial. And that's what we're parodying in our logo. That's kind of what we're doing with the NPR theme today. That's why most of what you're hearing is audio. Why is Serial, which was produced by WBEZ in Chicago and This American Life, so effective? Well, it's got all of these elements. It's affirmative. It's reaffirmative. It helps us to understand that, yes, there is a justice system in the world. That, yes, these things are based... These decisions in these systems are based on all the type of stuff that Sarah Koenig was doing in her investigative reporting. But it's also disjunctive. It's dissonant, too, because we feel for the defendant, well, <laughs> the accused, the guilty in this case, Adnan Syed. We feel for him. We feel that perhaps, perhaps justice might not have been done. 
And what does that mean? Why? How? What does it mean when those kind of questions are raised about our legal system? And they're questions that, that aren't just raised by NPR hosts. <laughs> those are restin- questions that can be raised by park service rangers and interpreters. Our justice system, is it fair? Was it fair? When is it fair? Is it fair to other human beings? Is it fair to our climate? Is it fair to our natural landscapes? Of course, it's entertaining. It's amazingly scripted. It's amazingly built. And it's a true story, but it uses all of the tools of creative fiction to show plot and narrative and introducing the right device at the right moment. And through that, it's engaging, too. It allows you to get to know real people in real ways and experience their lives as they unfold in front of them. It's destructive, too. Eight episodes, nine episodes, I can't remember exactly how many. Twelve episodes, thank you, John. But it didn't have an ending. It didn't have a conclusion. It left this giant question mark. And the question mark still lingers, too. I just heard a couple days ago that Adnan's case is now up for appeal. Partially because of what was done during Serial, but even the outcome of that is completely unknown. And it destroys the heart to get to know these people and understand them and think that you know what the truth might be, and then to realize that the wheels of justice grind very slowly. Now, other people have been investigating Serial. They've been investigating why it's powerful storytelling. And there was a great uh, great article on Fast Co-Create that talked about the storytelling elements. I've kind of boiled it down. I've boiled them down, um, but there's a link down in the show notes down uh, down below the video here. Um, You might not want to open it now because I think it might uh, close this video. And you want to pay attention to us. Um, But open that later on and read the article because it's amazing and it's fascinating. I tried to boil down the four ideas that the author had in that article. But these are really the things in serial that work very well. It introduces limited details at a time. It develops a story piece by piece, tiny bit by tiny bit over time. That's a really powerful thing to think about. It's about pushing forward and and pushing the ideas in increments. Of course, it also has all of those details introduced have a payoff. They're all headed someplace. It doesn't introduce details that aren't going to play somehow into this grand decision by the end. In fact, I would say if you went back and listened to the whole series, there's not a single detail in there that doesn't matter somehow to the outcome of one story or another, one experience or another. Challenge the audience assumptions. You should always be pushing the boundaries. This is, this is at the core of interpretation. In a nutshell, this is this is meaningful interpretation. This is Freeman Tilden. This is, in essence, multiple perspectives. If you believe one thing, it's my responsibility as an interpreter to show you the opposite opinion, to show you the opposite perspective. So then you can go, ooh, there's more than me in the world. More exists than that which is confined by my skull. And then finally, this one's the, the one that I think is really, really cool. The journey matters far more than the destination. The act of consuming, of thinking, of mulling, of getting there matters so much more if you construct it well and construct it right than the outcome, than the conclusion. The conclusion of this podcast, I'm going to give it away, sorry, spoiler alert, is a giant question mark. But over the course of those 12 episodes, Sarah Koenig earns the question mark. And that's what I think is fascinating about that. It's hers to wear proudly because it's not about where she was headed. It's about everything that she struggled through and, by proxy, you struggled through with her over the course of the journey. So if you haven't consumed it yet, consume it. Um, Head over to Serial Podcasts. The whole thing is on there for free. It's a podcast, so it's 
free. Uh, download, listen, and, and think about it from an interpreter's perspective, too. Think about it from how this is telling very keen stories with intellectual and emotional connections all over the place. But I want you to remember, if you haven't consumed it yet, you're consuming the series very differently than it was built and intended to be consumed. Because a series has different meanings when consumed after the fact than when it's consumed as it's being broadcast. This is really fascinating to me, how, how binge-watching has changed how we consume media. This is the episode list of uh, Black Mirror, which is a Channel 4 series from Britain. It's a fascinating series, very much like a modern Twilight Zone, hence why I'm geeking out over it recently. The Black Mirror is the screen you have right in front of you. Um, it's the cell phone screen. It's, it's those mirrors that we have around us that are not shiny, but are black. I binge-watched this a couple weeks ago on a Sunday night. I started with, uh, well, you can see there's two seasons, two series here. I started with that first episode, and I started working my way through. They're about an hour long each. I got four episodes in. It's a horror series. It's a thriller series. It's a psychological thriller. I got four episodes in and had to stop, not because it was too late, because it wasn't. It was only like 9 o'clock. I had to stop because I was too emotionally drained to push through the rest. It had affected me so much because I was binge watching it. Because I was watching it one after the other after the other. It was like a hammer against my head. Look at the air dates on those. 4th of December, 11th of December, 18th of December. When people watched them when they were broadcast, they had time to digest. They had time. They had a week between broadcast to broadcast to go, oh, okay. I lived the rest of my life. I hugged my wife. <laughs> I've seen my kids. I've put them on the bus to school. Uh, things are okay. The world is okay. I was watching it without those breaks in between, which meant it was a very, very different experience than watching it over the course of, well, you can see by the time that I get to the skip between episode four, three and four that I watched, it was two years. <laughs> two years to decompress. Binge watching creates different feelings, different emotions than watching in a series. To binge or not, it's not your choice. This is the key thing to remember. That which we produce will be binged. I think we should live with the new meanings that binge watching creates. Some folks are creating things specifically to be binge watched. Uh, House of Cards is one of the best examples of that. It's a series that really is meant to batter against your skull for 10 or 12 episodes straight in a row. Um, brilliantly constructed like that, and brilliantly destructive like that. So when we're thinking of these meaning-making opportunities, when we're thinking of uh, these opportunities to create seasons and, and serial meaning-making, um, it's a fascinating, fascinating world. But it's something you should go into intentionally thinking about. You should be intentionally thinking about this and intentionally thinking about how you construct the, um, the opportunity. To, to see everything that's possible. These are intentionality writ large. So John's going to take over in just a second and talk about, um, he's going to talk about the other end of this, the flip side of this coin. The idea that, um, well, that you got to make these things. you got to build them. you got to produce them. Which means that you got to put some work in. you got to put some effort in. And that effort's going to take time. It's going to take planning. And John is good at planning. John is good at, well, he may not be good at planning. I can pick on him on that one. But he's at least good at conceptualizing planning. And that's the most important thing. What does it mean to think about your plan? Uh, what does it mean to build your plan? And then, well, he's usually handing the plan over to somebody else to activate. So, John. Thanks, John. So really, of course, the just are good. So serial and uh, you know, and so John and I both listened to this. I think we kind of finished it off almost at the same time. So uh, and it was an amazing series. But you know, I think looking at what that is, what the other podcasts that have come out, 
you know, and then when you start thinking about what serialized or episodic content really means, is you know a hugely um, is a thing that we've talked about before. I mean, I think in the first digit term we talked about the power of episodes, making a series, making um, you know because we always had a video and an audio day, and making that series, making that episodic content, and there's powers to that. You know, there's very powerful things to it, and you know some of that is. I mean, the biggest thing is is the subscription value in it. So, you know, with blogs, with podcasts, with video playlists, we have this huge, um, this huge thing about subscription. It's not like your Twitter feed. It's not like your your Facebook feed, which are more generalistic. These are subscriptions for a specific type of content for a specific thing, and you can get thousands and tens of thousands. And if you know, we hit it out the park hundreds of thousands of people to subscribe. And that subscription is just like a magazine. You know, it hits your inbox every time or it downloads to your phone or it shows up in your YouTube list as something you haven't seen yet. It's something that you've purposely gone out of your way to click to always get notified or always have a download. And that's a powerful, powerful thing comparatively to it being lost in the noise in places. Um, there are other subscriptions. We're going to talk about some more serial and series make pieces, but really, you know, it's about getting that audience to know that this is something special, that you've made this as a separate piece, that it isn't just a, uh, a random post, it isn't just a random video we've put up. And those random videos and those random posts are fine, right? But we're talking about how do you make something that for your park, or for your program, that is more than just a thing about your park or just goes into that giant park can, that giant park theme can. Um, so one thing though, you know, and I love to hit the numbers and I'll read you, just give you some numbers and I'll send you a little thing though, but oddly enough, people, you know, and it's not just Serial doing this, but everything is going crazy right now with podcasting and with these other forms of content that aren't that video and that blog, podcasting's grown by 25% over the last year. That's a huge number on plays in social media, especially with something that everybody said that died. You know, really, people said podcasting died in like 2010. Um, you know, now I think my original old numbers were like 12 million people had watched a podcast. And that was back, I kind of went and looked earlier today at some of those old Diginterp PowerPoints about this. Now we're up to 34 million people have listened to a podcast in the last month. Now, a lot of that million is because of this serial podcast and some of the other podcasts that are coming out, Invisibilia, Startup, and some of these other podcast series. But the power of podcasting is really um, expanding. And, um, and the power of even just video playlists and videos. I mean, look at all the number of video channels, things like that, that are out there. So, oh, that's right. We're, no, we're, we're trying a new thing, so you guys know. So episodic content. So the biggest thing is, and you know, this is it was kind of funny going through this and figuring it out. I, I kind of used the same some of the same thought process when we built this. But it's really, you know, of course, it's always going to go back to planning and strategizing for it. You have a big marketing component, right? Nobody's going to listen to any of this if they don't know about it. And it all needs to feel like it's from one special source and that this is a separate kind of piece of content. This isn't just posts on our Facebook page that are, you know happening, that, that they have a different kind of feel and look and everything else to it. And then you have the broadcast side, you know, so how do we broadcast it? What's the timing on that? And then the after piece, you know, what can we do with all this content we've built, if it's video, pictures, tweets, something like that, what can we do with that after the fact? So planning. So really, you know, going to be the same slam into you. Go get a team of people, find a partner, get some volunteers to help you. You know, if you're doing something like a podcast or a video, you're going to need help technically. You're going to need help with storytelling. Um, you might need to find some volunteers to help you um, tell that that basic story, you know, or the the people that were actually there. A lot of our parks have living people that were there when things were started. And if it's that small little piece, you're definitely going to need to pull from it. But the technical help is a big thing. Um, technicals are really the you know how do people technically. Um, how, how can what is the technical help? So that's like people that do radio. You know, why not contact a local NPR station? Why not contact the uh, the 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 place? 
you know, the community college with the video and the audio people that can hit it out the park from you. They need that kind of that real life work kind of pieces. You know, there's no there's no reason why they couldn't help and come do this in your park. Um, and they might you might actually be able to if you find a partner good enough or that's willing to you might be able to do all of it without doing any of it. Um, you know, without doing much at all, other than doing this planning, you, know, you can hand this off to a community college and let them make five or six episodes for you, and that's the podcast series. That's it. It ends. And the biggest thing is also to get management buy-in. So you have to make sure that your management is comfortable with you doing this, that it's part of a goal, that it reaches a larger goal, and then it might be able to be used in something else. So a lot, a lot of times we shoot video, we shoot podcasts, we go do photos and things like that. They always wanted to have put it into something else. Could you chop this up and make it into a tour of your park or something like that in the future? Could you make it so that it's part of a uh, something in an exhibit? The theme. So the theme or series though, and this is one of those hard concepts that you know. And it's not that the series out there that don't do this aren't correct. It's just that you know if you want to get down, and this is why some of these things are so great, is that you you need a theme that is not just the park. If it's just the park, the series never ends. It's just a series that goes on forever. It doesn't conclude. It doesn't go away. Um, it's more like a piece of broad, more like a piece of real broadcast media, like something on NPR that's a constant, or on regular TV, like where it's you know it's just this constant, the news or something like that. You know, it's not going to have an end. It's not going to be telling a story across the entire series. It can still be a series. But it's not the kind of series that John and I are talking about. The series where you know we're trying, we're thinking that could be made. You know, a slice of something small. You know, we have big parks, we have big things going on. We can tell that tiny story, you know, over a section, over multiple days, over multiple um, episodes, over multiple weeks, over multiple months. We can go back and we can tell the story of how we found this special artifact. You know, and how we got a hold of it, who owned it, who's touched this, who's done this. I mean, just think of that. You could tell an entire series just from one thing. So find that small thing, that important small thing, the thing that, that still meets your park goals, but it's not just about your park. It's not just this generalistic bucket we're going to put it in. Something unknown, why it was unknown. You know, there's just these themes that can come from it, these things. The biggest thing also, though, is that the theme and the, the overall... Um, SI content is digestible. That it has cliffhangers, which I don't know why it's on the same line, and that it's reducible. So you can cut it down to something that people can take off. You know, it doesn't have to be a 50-minute podcast. It can be a two-minute podcast. It can be a one-minute podcast. It can be a 20-minute podcast, though, too. I mean, there's no reason not to to chop to have these things that they could be um, in pieces. Choose a format. This doesn't have to be a podcast. We've talked a lot about that because that's what our uh, initial focus is, but it can be audio, video, photos, or just posts, blog posts, posts on your Facebook page. Facebook could be your medium. It could be your format. And then so how do we how do we make that so it feels like a series more than not being a series? And we'll talk about some of those ideas and what those are in a minute. But look at your audience. Think about the time it takes to create that format. You know, do you have the time to make a video every three weeks or every month or every week? Do you have the time, though, to make photos? Do you have the time to just write posts? Outline episodes. You know, make all the titles. This is something, you know, you'd be surprised probably. But John and I actually do do a little bit of this when we're even just making Digit Interp, you know, make all the titles for the year. The times we haven't, we're not so good at doing the uh, these episodes. Um, you know, make all the titles up. Develop, like, a basic timeline for how the content's going to be built. And make six, can you make six, 10, or 18 of these things out of that outline of episodes? You know, can you actually make a list of, of episode, uh, make a list of episodes that all are logical, that are all part of that overall theme? And if you can't, you don't. This is not a theme podcast that John and I have. This is more like a news thing that we put on, like it's a training element. So you have to see, this is not, this isn't, John and I aren't trying to sell ourselves that we've done this, but making titles for things and making that outline for the con timeline, the outline for content is really important. I should say outline. Timing. Make hard timelines for a release. Is it going to be weekly, monthly, some other release kind of dates? 
meet the goal or the audience leave. So on the one side, you have the binge watch is all afterwards. But if you're not, you know, that's for the after. If you're releasing this and your idea is to release this over time, in a in a fashion where people can absorb it in one way, on a weekly, monthly, or some other sort of release time, you need to make sure that you do it. Um, if you're doing museum Mondays, make sure that you have something uh, for the museum on Mondays. Or if it was a special collection in the museum, that'd be more in our theme. You know what we're saying. <laughs> you know that would be. You know you want to make sure you're hitting that every Monday. Timely episodes makes your social media bubble expand. What I mean by that is you you know if you if you slowly let let your audience see all the episodes on a timely fashion, it'll expand. If you miss a week, you've lost the, some of that momentum. You lost the push. You've lost what happens. It's what happens when parks don't post in in reality on any of these media is enough. You know people lose the momentum in the media. They lose the momentum in in that they should see you. And those social media sites use algorithms based on momentum, like how many people are looking at things, and how often, and if you stop posting for like two weeks, it happened after the shutdown, or not, even though sometimes some parts went back to exactly the same number of posts per week, their you know reach and everything else was decimated because we had this dead bubble. And it happens, it can happen with this kind of thing too. Calendar, make a development calendar, make a calendar that includes review and releases, and make a calendar for auto-releasing. So calendaring, calendaring, calendaring. So come up with your time, time schedules so it's almost like time, but it's different. You know, come up with how you're going to make this and how this is going to function and how you're going to auto-release it. So if you're doing posts, Museum Mondays, or if you're doing posts over an entire, maybe you're doing posts over an entire week that are the same kind of thing, they can be all pre-put into a calendar. They can all automatically post. They can all happen automatically. So you're not having to worry about it on that Tuesday to do it. Marketing. So how will you tell people about this? You know, of course you market on your NPS.gov, but you got to market on social media, or market on you know, the press release. Think of that, or market on in print. So a lot of our our digital content doesn't end up making it back onto the visitor center's desk or into Ranger programs, things like that, for people to know that there's this extended content available from us. Um, so one of those things is to make sure that people know it a larger medium. Um, you know, especially if we're spending a lot of time actually making a series versus um, just making a single um, video. Look how cereal, cereal is marketed. It's totally odd. You know, they started as part of This American Life, which is not an F, it's an L. Um, <laughs> as part of This American Life. So they played one episode. So how can you make your content, your first thing, shine? So if your park doesn't have a big social media presence, if your park doesn't have a big, um, you know, presence in, with the podcasting community or something like that, how can you make that shine? Do you use a partner? Do you find a local, do you find another park that might be interested, that has a similar theme that would be interested in letting, like, talking about your first episode? Could you get the national page to post about your first episode? You know, these are all really uh, amazing places where this this can expand out into your, uh, you know, expand your social media network very quickly, which is what you need when you're doing these first releases. Brand and look. Develop a unique brand, unique look while keeping inside the MPS brand. So what do I mean by that? And a lot of parks have a lot of hard, they're not sure what that means. So that means it still needs to feel like the park service, and you still need to use the arrowhead properly, the black band, and some of the fonts, like when you're writing your name, the main park font, like Harper's Ferry. But what happens, why couldn't you use a custom kind of piece, you know, if it's a campaign or if it's a series? Um, you know, you can come up with a custom look, a custom coloration of the photo, the custom bars, you know, um, the custom um, overlay of graphics. It's not hard to do. It's not unusual. Uh, it's not something against the brand. Um, it's just something you need to think about and develop as part of this. You know, it's a, it's a feel, though, that you want to push across everything when you're marketing this. You don't want to let it, you know, have one look one week and one look the next, uh, especially when you're pushing things out to the public. Broadcast. So when you're actually putting up your podcast videos and posts, you know. So I talked about the subscription at the beginning, but that's really where the power is. So broadcasting it is really you're putting it out onto social media channels, but you really need to get subscribers. Um, when you're putting out podcasts or videos, you know you want to gain subscribers. The beauty of subscribers is they come back every week or every month or whenever you put it up. 
They get notified. It downloads. It's like that magazine, like I said before. It arrives to them. It comes to them. That's the power of subscription versus the power of just pushing it out there. You know, you want to convert people that are listening and watching your broad, your broadcast to subscribers. So bank and evergreen pro content. So this is really a kind of a planning thing, but it's also, I think it's a part of the broadcast. It's an idea of when you're building your broadcast pieces out. So you have to pre-make things. So you're pre-making three to five episodes or posts. You're taking those photos. You're getting the, that audio done, you know. So one, so there's two different terminology here, and we'll just let, let you know the differences, and you can think about how you want to do it. So for blogs, I always say make, you know, three to five evergreen posts before you even publish your blog. Same thing could happen with audio or podcasts or any other kind of series. And those can be put up at any time. They're evergreen. They never go away. They never die. They're about a theme. They're about something that can fit in always. They wouldn't be part of the episodic content exactly. Banking posts is how is where you would make two to three posts uh, well, done well ahead of time. But they would be part of that. But you would be on a schedule so that if you got behind by two weeks, you got sick. Somebody else gets sick. You can't make the podcast that week. That you know you have a two to three to week window or a month window because you've made them ahead of time. All, you know, all major, pod, a lot of major podcasts do this that are, you know, based on the news. And ours is not most likely going to be based on news. That would be an interesting thing. But that's a different kind of production schedule. But our production schedule for most of our podcasts can be done over that, that period, and they can be banked. One thing about banking and evergreening, though, that a lot of people get hung up on is they do sometimes put in things that are about seasonality or things about... Um, Sort of, you know, some of those news things or things that might have happened. Um, so you have to be really aware of what what you put into those evergreen posts, as well as you need to make sure that. And this is one of those things of almost pre-making calendars. You don't want to make something that's evergreen, that maybe would be construed differently. You don't want to release something evergreen that could be construed differently based on what just happened. You know, like if we had a whole an evergreen post about inflate inflating something. We might not want to put it out right after the Patriots in Flategate. Now, if that was part of our, you know, our thought process, that'd be different. But you know, we don't want to just put out things about, you know, how something like that. You know, so you don't want to be too periodic. You don't. You want to make sure you know what's in those evergreen posts too, and read them before you post them. Intentional. Be intentional with them. Yes. And the good thing about evergreen posts too is you can always modify the beginning and the end to make it more so it fits in wherever you're you're doing it. But the beauty of evergreen posts is it's like having substitute plans. Okay, I can't write my, I can't write this right now. We should put it up. It's what John and I should actually do with this podcast. <laughs> timely. I didn't even. I just had to make it again. Release them timely. If this is an episodic series that is going to be time-based release, make sure you release them timely. 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 Reaction. Watch the reaction on social media. So this is part of when you're actually broadcasting. Does your audience have questions that need answering? Can you include the audience in future episodes, like crowdsource of stories or crowd pull their stories into it? You know, that's a huge thing. You know, how does your how is your reaction to the post? I mean, are you getting comments or people asking um, in social media posts that are about the video or the podcast or about just the, the podcast? Or are people posting photos that look like the photos that you posted as part of yours? How do you make sure that you're then inviting them just to do that after that, but also how you include them in that story? The after. So push it again. Market it again. On days one relevant in that next year with other parks. You know, maybe you wrote something that is very not about the park you're in, but about the theme that your park's about or about a thing that's in your park that could be completely relatable to somebody else. You know, let them remarket it. Let them use pieces of it. Let them, you know, have them market it over a, a series. Um, and you can always do a re-release. You know, you can always make it feel like and do the release over a weekly thing, um, or do updates to that what it was about. Do an update episode at the end if you had something new. Like if it was about an artifact, and then the artifact is now going into conservation at this point, you could do an update episode about the conservation of it. Binge. John mentioned this. I won't go too heavy into it, but let people know the whole what the whole thing. What was it? Let the people know when the whole thing's available. I mean, that's one big thing. So the after marketing is really let people know that they can download the whole thing right now. Um, 
binge watching and listening, and John likes my term here, is a thing. It's a thing that people do now. It's a it's part of our culture. It's part of how um, digital media works versus old media. You know, if you don't have a vision at the point, you know what binge watching is because that's what you get to do with everything. Um, YouTube playlists are now have been changed to be all bingeable. So if you have a playlist on YouTube, it just plays and it plays the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one automatically. If you watch Netflix, it plays the next one and the next one and the next one automatically. So binge watching and listening is a thing. Now, it's something that I wouldn't even plan for. It's not something that I would uh, be thinking about, but it's something that you can always remarket to people. And it's over. You don't have to make it open-ended. Finish it. Make a last episode. Like John said, even if it doesn't mean anything, I mean, even if it comes to be no fruition, like if you are actually making a podcast or a posting thing about something and the fruition was sort of left in the air, it can just end. You can just stop it. But you need to make sure it ends. So that way it doesn't seem like you just decided to stop making episodes for it. And so planned endings, know that it ends. Have a day when it ends. You know, you can always make a second series if that was really popular. Um, you know, so make sure you just have an end for it. Ideas. So these were just some things we got the regular one going around. Museum Mondays, Thursdays, Wednesdays, whatever day of the week you wanted to be. Um, Audio postcards are a popular thing. Uh, we know that Yellowstone has a few of those up there. They're really interesting. Um, they're released in a series. They're really, um, they have some imagery and some look that goes with them. If you go look, they have little stampers on them and things like that. They look really nice. Um, they're two, three minutes. They're simple, easy. Um, you know, they were made, you know, I believe, with a, either with a partner or with some sort of small contract or volunteer th work. It was a great function of how that worked. You know, there's the idea of that peek into the collection. You know, maybe that's a weekly or monthly kind of thing. You know, how can we go peek into our collection, go find the things people haven't seen? Do a Sunrise Monday. That's a simple one, right? But if you brand it, you talk about it, hashtag it, it's a series, you know, and maybe that one doesn't have an end, but there are thoughts of how could you do these things, you know, like leaf, the leaves changing, the cherry blossoms, the wildflowers coming out, the snow melt, the snow. I mean, if you're in some parks right now in the West, it'd be really interesting to talk about the no snow happening, right? And if you're in some parks in Boston, you could talk about all the snow that's happening. Um, you know, but that would, you know, it's, but the thoughts are doing it is planning it versus doing it instantly. So we can make a lot of posts about that kind of stuff. But if we planned our posting and kind of told that story of how this is really affecting people and what it's going to affect in the future and what it means when we get some snow this week and next week we don't. You know, that's a series, and we can cut it off at the end. Um, just these are ideas we threw out, I think, last time we spoke, and then a webcam of today. You know, some of these are campaigns or pushes, um, but, you know, just thinking about that episodic, those pieces, you know, sometimes it doesn't work as well. Thinking about episodes on Facebook without thinking about how that text would be built. But there are definitely ways to do it, you know, over a season, like how you can talk about the season and having it begin and end, you know, just talk about the fall, just talk about the winter. That's it. I'm going to slide back in here. Ding. I'm going to take the microphone back too, John. Um, so no, that, I think there's some some amazing possibilities that exist with the idea of creating series of content. And um, we've seen a, a bunch of parks do some really great serialized content. Um, some some of them are doing serialized content that's not thematically focused. Um, it's it's more doing it on a park level. That's okay. Uh, but where we've really seen folks shine is when they're really focusing down on a really tight, specific area of the resource. I think my, my favorite example of this is um, Stories in Stone from Andersonville. Um, it's a project that was uh, masterminded by Chris Barr and Stephanie Steinhorst and, and Eric Leonard down at Andersonville. And um, that, that program is just beautiful because it focuses down on one gravestone. It's very tight. It's very, very well-produced. Um, it's released on YouTube, so it's a video series. Um, it was released episodically, periodically, on a set schedule. Um, they did special episodes and special thematic episodes. They did a full episode in Spanish for a Spanish-speaking uh, burial 
within the within oh, the cemetery. Right. So really, really cool stuff that they that they had done with that series. Um, and just take a look at that and just see how a park can do serialized content and really focus down on the small, the tight, and introducing a few details here and there. But it's it's intriguing to think about that as a series. Each one works stands alone. But then taken together, you start to feel the weight, the interpretive weight of that cemetery, of the thousands and thousands of men that are buried there. Any fun, any favorite series for you, John? Well, I do like the Yellowstone podcast series, the audio postcards. I think they're really interesting. I think that the, the short, the length, and those things are really great. I like the way they get introduced. I don't know if they're introduced on MPS.gov the same way because of the way it's made, but the, definitely the introduction of them on their social media sites are definitely themed in a certain um, way, but I mean, I do love the uh, you know the Yosemite Nature Note series. It's a great video series. It tells a, a great story. It's got a theme based around you know really that that it's almost like the old Yosemite Nature Notes magazine. Now that one's a hard one, right? Because it is that park bucket. So it's not you know people are getting content about Yosemite, but it's not about something specific. Um, so it, you know it kind of crosses those two sides. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it would be to, um, well, Stories in Stone would be the serial. Right. What that, what um, the Nature Notes is to This American Life. Right, exactly. Um, where, where it has a larger bucket. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something you have to, you have to be very conscious of. Um, each episode should have the same tone as the last one. You should be able to tell that they're related to one another, even if they're not about the same thing. And um, the, the interesting thing about Series of Stone, though, is that you could actually... I mean, they could have some sort of thing like where you made it so that you're going from one end of the cemetery to the other, and that there's a physical end when you get to the back. Yeah. You know, and then you can tell another series where you do the same thing, you go from the back to the front or something. And you know, that's the way that you can make it more manageable. Because the problem with most podcast series for parks and for any organization is making it manageable. So making things manageable means making it so that you're doing six episodes. 12 episodes, and that's it. You know, we can plan it, we can put it in. It's not a forever thing. Um, and that way we can see that we can go back. We have to look at the analytics afterwards, see how many people actually watched it, see how it's going. It's not just this thing we're having to, we're pumping. We're pumping out. Well, and as an agency that has a lot of folks that move around a lot, um, sometimes it can fall on one or two of your shoulders to, to get this done. If you have a series like that, that that's planned out, it's discrete, it's 12, you're going to do 12 episodes, um, then it doesn't look like as soon as Joe Smith left the park, suddenly our entire social media world evaporated. That may be the truth, but it doesn't look like that. Instead, the series ended. It was intended to end. Doing small pockets like that, especially for those of you that have lots of seasonal work or that for those of you out there that are seasonals that want to do something like this over the course of a summer, it doesn't mean that you have to see your baby die. Um, it means that uh, instead you can kind of discreetly plan out its entire lifespan. No, exactly. You know, it's interesting. One thing that sparked to mind while you were talking, John, is the idea of resharing and re remarketing. And it made me think of uh, the Planet Money podcast, which is an NPR podcast, a really uh, amazing little podcast. And one of the things they do really well is they reuse old episodes that touch on things that are happening currently. And the way that they do that is instead of just dumping the old episode in the stream, they record a new bumper at each end where they say, you know, such and such has been in the news recently, blah, 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 blah. This episode originally aired two years ago. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, they give you this tiny little update on it. It made me think of that, that artifact thing you were saying, that, that this content can be reused and remixed and recycled constantly. And frankly, people consume this stuff just like I ride Disney rides 12 and 15 times. People listen to podcasts. They watch videos. They, over over. they even look at pictures in albums on Facebook or, or tweets over and over again. They will go deep diving through your content and binging on it. And um, they love this stuff again. It's 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 just like repeats on TV. Everybody watches those old, those old Simpsons episodes or those old South Park episodes, even though we've seen them ten million times. No, I definitely agree. I mean, binge watching, getting making this content, and also making the content so it's usable, not just inside of podcasts, also, but thinking about what else you could use it for. If you're making a series of episodic. Uh, of just a series where you're recording someone maybe going through your park and those feelings that they might have, and then you have a ranger that's bumpering it on each side, you can build that into an audio tour very easily mm -hmm. after you're finished. You know, you can make it into a, 
any sort of small, you know, you can make it into something that plays inside the exhibit and it's an interactive or something. It makes great archival content for your for your um, park historian to put into the archives for 50 years from now, someone to know how the park was being used. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's an oral history of your park, but it's also interpretive content you're producing now. It's for an exhibit you produced two years down the road. That's really fascinating to think that way, too. I mean, and, and the thought that it doesn't always have to be a video or a podcast, is one thing that I want to push. You know, I know that, and there's another one that I meant to mention is the Michael Lang series that he did um, about two years ago, or a year ago. It was on Centennial Stories, 30 and 30. It was 30 days of Northeast region, um, oh no, call to action stories. And he had a Tumblr blog, and really that had all those hallmarks of good brand, good uh, imagery, good text, and everything else. And it was all done ahead of time. You know, it was all created way ahead of time. You know, and got posted. I, I mean, maybe not every single piece of it. You know, Michael can comment if that wasn't true. But you know, the uh, you know, really the the beauty of it was it was all chunked out and put up onto this Tumblr blog, um, and it was perfect. And they also shared it across a bunch of other places, and that gave content to the parks to other parks to use about that. You know, it gave them really professional content. But he also did you know a special look on every photo. It had coloration overlays, and so you know, in marketing to people. Um, you know, and making sure people know that this is part of a bigger thing, and that this is not just a one-off, is a very important thing. You know, it gets people to go look at more stuff. Yeah, branding your ideas, not just branding as an agency, but branding these individual chunks of ideas is really important. Um, one of the things that I've done, kind of um, outside parks, outside the park service life, uh, I was working with um, one of the local historical societies, building uh, a Thursday night post on their on their pages, and um, we made sure that I was. They didn't want the photos to be able to be used anyplace else. So I colorized them so that they looked like you know they they popped. They were black and white photos, so I made them a green color or you know just dragging the little colorized bar in Photoshop, and then dropped an overlay over it that branded it so that if it got shared, you could tell, oh, this came from this series, and it's the Adams County Historical Society, and wow, that's a really cool photo. Um, so it so it gave it trackback potential. But it also just kind of said, okay, this is part of this. This is part of this long flow of I'm going to keep looking for these things over and over again. Appointment television, um, only appointment television for different different worlds. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that we're at our hour. To be I don't wanna, timely. Yeah. To be to be timely. Uh, we'll come back to you next month <laughs> with another Diginterp in depth. Thank you for joining us. And uh, and if you have any questions, you can kick them into the Diginterp Facebook group. Hashtag Diginterp. D I G I N T E R P. Um, or you can email either of us. Uh, anybody at the National Park Service is first name underscore last name. So you look down there at the bottom, and you've got our emails. First name underscore last name at nps.gov. Um, so let us know if you have any questions or comments or toss them in the comment box here on the video and uh, and someone will be sure to answer them, I'm sure, because, uh, well, not even me. I mean, we've got a whole community no, of, right. of thousands of people, literally, um, who, um, who care about this, uh, just like you do. So thank you for joining us. Don't forget to look for the links. Oh, yeah, there's links down in the bottom. Um, there's, there's a couple links down in the doodly-doo. Um, down in the bottom here, and um, the first link there is uh, is the audio for the theme song of Serial, something that's copyrighted and I didn't want to throw into the stream, but um, if you go and you play that in one browser window and then you play us in the other, you can kind of feel like it's uh, feel it's it, it, it's this really well-produced thing. Awesome. Thank you for joining us here in Harper's Ferry, uh, wherever you are, and uh, we'll see you next month on Digiturp In-Depth. Have a good one. See you.